good afternoon here it's uh, Veterans Day November 11th 430 in the afternoon and just kind of showing a little bit more what it takes and what else it takes to own be responsible for an airplane and what uh, and the hurdles and hoops that you have to learn to deal with all the different people and agencies and uh, repair stations and parts salvagers, to you name it, uh, and how to not get your head taken off all along the way, because <laughs> everywhere, every step that you make as an aircraft owner can make you or break you with one part. I don't know what that one part is. It all doesn't, doesn't matter. Throughout the whole entire airplane, there's multiple, multiple one parts. If it goes bad, it, you scrap the plane kind of deal. Far, or you're going to put $50,000 into it and you've already, if you bought it for 100000 it's only worth 100000 and then you got to put a fifty thousand dollar repair. You're into your airplane for one hundred and fifty thousand, and if you had to sell it for some reason, you can only going to get a hundred. So, as a business operation, an ongoing concern with pocket leasing, it's paramount that we as a company watch our expenditures on every single bolt, nut, washer, gasket. You name it. That doesn't mean buying the cheapest. I'm not about. I'm not not here to do that. I'm here to identify good, better, best. What works now for a while. What needs to be fixed now. What doesn't have to be fixed now. And make a plan of attack for all different levels. And my goal is to eventually, in a perfect world, is to change every nut and bolt and washer all along the way for the next 10 years, owning the airplane, operating it. I enjoy the work. I, I'll just take it by section by section. And it's my hobby, my, my job. Uh, I shouldn't say hobby, but it's from a veteran perspective, uh, keeping myself occupied as a uh, and not having veteran issues, <laughs> so to speak. This is a good project to keep, I can engross myself into nuts and bolts and washers all day long and be happy. So anyway, so I'll show you a little bit about, this is just the uh, engine, the parts manual for the engine, uh, not the airframe or avionics or anything else, just the engine. So here we go. So what I've done here, <coughs> is printed out from the Continental IO 470 or the 470 manual parts manual only the sections that are applicable to the L IO 470 L model and then you have categories that come down and through these different models IO says all I, there's all is 470, 470 cubic inch block and cylinder heads. There's O 470s, which are just deposing. Uh, o means opposing, so it's a six cylinder engine. One piston on one side, one piston on one side, another piston on the other, all the way down. That opposing, that so the O means opposing cylinders. The I for IO, the I part means injection, fuel injection, and that's kind of what we're dealing with a little bit here. This is fuel injection stuff. So an IO, so injected, opposing six cylinder, 470 cubic inch, 470. So the difference really just comes down to whether, and so the O 470 is carbureted. So it really just comes down to whether you got a carbureted system or you have a fuel injected system. And the 470 is the cubic inch or the size of displacement of the piston uh, and cylinder, the, the, the bore and the stroke. 
So a big block Chevy 454, the IO 470 is bigger than a 454 Chevy. So this is a 470 cubic inch. Kind of put it in reference. Um, so that's now you have the so I'm I have injected O four seventy and it is it comes so for the Baron, the Beechcraft Baron comes in the L model. So IO dash four seventy dash L. So that it means where these kind of this is the plumbing the L means it's how it's plumbed for for the Baron for the where the firewall is and where how it's you know it's engine mounts where everything sits best case scenario and the L model is what was chosen for or designed for the Baron I think really much the Baron's the only one that runs the L model um, so they've been making this engine since well the IL 470 since the 50s maybe the 40s even well definitely into the 50s so the, the 470 came into the 50s. Uh, the Baron that we're working on is a 1964. So these, this is a 1964, 470 cubic inch opposing cylinder aircraft engine. And when you say aircraft engine, car engines pretty much work at sea level to maybe three or 4,000 feet. You know, every once in a while you go over 5,000 feet. And if you're in Colorado, you know, you, you're getting up in there, but with fuel injecting cars, they compensate for altitude, the density altitude, the, uh, all that, the humidity, the factors that cause air to, to expand and contract. Well, as you go up, the air is expanding and getting less and less molecules, so air, air is basically spreading out, so to speak. This is less molecules. Well, the time you get up there and heat on the pistons and valves and cold air and things like this, you have to allow for expansion and contraction of metal parts and plastic parts and oil and everything else. Everything is expanding and contracting with heat and cold. And these old en these old engines that were designed really in the 30s became became really so the precursor of the 425. And, I, and the O200 and some of these older vintage aircraft engines were the precursors to this 470 and um, it's been a stable engine been a great engine for all the years it's, they still produce it um, you can still buy them still buy it new for $50,000 for an engine so every engine you're at forty to $50,000 if you do a complete firewall forward for each engine, that means every nut and bolt, uh, pulley, washer, starter, generator, you name it. Okay, so this is an old school 1964 IO470L model, and it came with 25 amp generators, not alternators, generators, old school generators that you'd find on an old, old truck, an old army truck. The old school generator system <clears throat> works. The only problem is you got to have the RPMs going, and with the airplane propeller or with the propeller on the end of it, you're you can't run the engine high enough to run the generator to make a charge. So when you're sitting there taxiing, or you're sitting, and the engines are running, and you got all the switches on, and the, and the avionics are on, the lights are all on, the the voltage hitting the battery is draining that battery down to nothing, and the generator isn't is not doing anything because it's not spinning fast enough. I had a little interruption there. <clears throat> All right. I'll leave a message. So the alternator will start producing amperage, producing power at a lower RPM. That's why we went to the alternator. Though on an alternator, you still have to have electric voltage to excite the excite the circuit in order for the alternator then to create a, you know, to, to be able to produce power. Um, the, 
the gener your airplane or your battery your battery can be completely dead, not even on there, and hand prop the star or hand prop it start starting it by hand propping it. Once you get it running, the generators start generating, and they're generating voltage. And you don't have to worry about if the whole system's dead. Like if you take off and leave it, come back in a month, and the whole battery's dead, you need to fly it. You just tie, secure it underneath the wing in the rear, set it all up, fuel, uh, fuel pump, and everything, get it all set up, and then go out and hand prop it. And uh, get one engine running, get charging, and then off that, after a minute, you can start the other engine. So anyway, kind of rambling. But it's a system upon systems. And this is all just what I'm doing with is just the engine, not the propeller, uh, not the mags. Not, it does get close to mags. It gets close to all the spark, the, the wiring. Uh, it does show the mags, but it doesn't break down the mags. I mean, it doesn't show how to take the mags and tear it down and completely re repair it or rebuild it. So none of the none of the information I have is on how to rebuild the stuff with different part numbers. It, it is what it is, and it is in that component. So it, that's a, a subsystem, and there's another parts manual for it. That particular manufacturer that made that particular part created another manual on servicing it, repairing it, overhauling it. Uh, complete with parts so all systems are like that every like I just spent a thousand dollars to the guys in Oklahoma there to rebuild this fuel pump this is just an old-school mechanical fuel pump it cost me a thousand dollars just to go have them take open that up and change all the washers nuts and o-rings and seals and then test it and certify it and make it FAA approved all the paperwork the FAA paperwork expensive so anyway, they, so I got that all set up, and now I'm getting all the nuts and bolts and washers, and I'll have everything, again, in kits, and I just keep doing this. So I'll, I just keep working around, and I keep working each section, each section. So right now, I'm, I got uh, Adam McPeck uh, for gaskets, and these guys do phenomenal top-grade gaskets. They have the cutting dies from Beechcraft. They do, what you, so what I've got is a list list here but I got it from my from my notes I've finally got through the list of all the gaskets not seals not anything else no screws washers or anything just gasket material for the all the different parts come on and off this the, see I need it some parts were leaking oil some parts had to come off some part anyway I'm just taking everything off and putting all new seals in it and so now I'm, I've got an email here going to Adam on all the seals for the engine and I'll get a price quote and then get I'll commission them to go forward and as owner as the aircraft owner I can commission new parts to be made as long as they meet specifications so I'm commit as an aircraft owner I'm, I will be commissioning Adam and Guy to produce uh, a bunch of gaskets for both engines so I'm what I'm ordering for ju not just one engine on this I'm ordering for both engine because the other engine the other needs to be taken things need to be taken off cleaned up and put a new gasket on it's leaking oil seeping so I'm gonna square everything up so all the oil leaks <laughs> so it, it just in this wrestling and, and this one part this one part here could cost a thousand fifteen hundred bucks uh, 500 bucks, uh, $2,300. I mean, I can go on and on and on, and everything is $1,000 or more, at minimum 500 But if I do my homework and I figure out what it is, who made it, where it's at, who, is there a scrap yard, is there a salvage yard, or is there someone on, that I can, that, you know, has old surplus parts that they've inherited, or they bought from an auction and they dig through the boxes and they put up the part number. I put in my part number and I find it and make a deal and I can inspect it. If it passes the owner, passes my inspection, I can then have, then I have the mechanic look at it and then he'll, or she will inspect it. And if it passes the mechanic, then we go put it on. 
uh, with the bus by the with the supervision of the mechanic. And if it's under an annual, which I'm still technically under the umbrella of the annual, I have to have not just an A and P sign off. I have to have an I A. Well, yeah. So technically, the annual's on hold until I get this fixed. Why do this and get this fixed? <clears throat> I can have an A and P sign off the work. Uh, uh, in order to do the annual, to sign the annual off, an A and P I A inspector authorization. Uh, I got a person with a I A certificate. A and P I A can sign off for the annual. Um, now he can sign or she can sign off the annual as not pat not being airworthy, and produce a discrepancy list. And I go, and he can or she fills out the the log book that did not pass the annual, signs off on it. We're done. Our our business agreements or our business relationship at that point is terminated. I pull out the airplane, remove the airplane, whatever, get it to wherever I'm putting it, and I can go have a mechanic then go here and work help me fix work on the list. I work with the mechanic, and we work everything off, and when everything's all lists are all signed off the annual then becomes current because the f what the IA put in the logbook that said it failed at the inspection well this was the list why it failed when we complete this list and the A and P then in the logbook fills in filled what what repairs were done that then supersedes the IA we got done what the IA said needed to be done A and P said it's done I don't have to go back to the IA and have them re-sign the annual now that it's all complete and airworthy. I don't, I don't have to do that. He already did, he or she did, Al already, let's say Al did my inspection and there's all this stuff we're working on. I can have him finish the, I, the inspection and not pass it. And then this is the list and then I can find an A&P, work with and or what have you make some arrangement work with Al and have Al supervise me which is what we're doing now but I'm not trying to drag Al I'm not trying to drag Al into this it's, I'm trying to for other aircraft owners or looking at being an aircraft owner how the system works but it's nice to find your Al so to speak your guy you, or a person that's all signed off and will work with you uh, trust you know learns your skills and your abilities and and as long as you don't you know, overstep your pay grade uh, and get a, a working plan together and follow the plan and have checks along the way, it's just as good as Al doing the work. And he's a supervisor. So, and in that way, I can work and build up my time as an apprentice to get two years under my belt of working on airplanes to get signed off to go take my AMP test. That's how that's how the system really is designed is under apprenticeship. So someone getting into the industry works doing everything as long as you're supervised. Anyway, after that after two years you can go in and take your written test and then you take an oral test, uh, practical, do a few things Make, do some sheet metal work and what have you and you get your license your AMP license and then three years after that you can get your inspector and inspector endorsement but right now I'm just trying to learn what it means to be an aircraft owner slash operator and then for my job as manager of Crockett leasing and then I have my issue of me personally of me is squared away as a pilot that's able to work for Crockett Leasing as as the pilot in command, as the operator part, so to speak. So I'm I have to separate everything into categories because if I don't, then it something goes wrong or I'm trying to do something else and leverage the business into another position or whatever the case may be if I structure crock leasing and mold myself into it I'm not separating 
myself from the corporation, it, what they call piercing the corporate veil. So I really take it serious, and it came from it came from legal attorneys that spent a lot of money setting up Crockett Leasing over the years. And I have to learn to respect it and understand it. So you have to learn. So I'm learning to be a corporate business owner. I'm learning to be in that process. The corporate, the corporation, owns an airplane, and it's got a lot of parts, <laughs> and a lot of pieces, and 1964 and corrosion and rust and everything else on an old car. This this is back when they used to make cars with breaker points where you had to you had to adjust your breakers in your distributor in order for your car to run. No electronic ignition, no fuel inj a little bit of fuel injection, my mechanical, no electrical. But um, anyway, kind of rambling on. But as an aircraft owner, I mean it's you burn through you just burn through notes burn through notes after notes these are everything that I've identified that needs to be done or and then here is a synopsis of the log books for one engine we're going backwards so I did them on this side and then all my working notes and parts and pieces and everything I did on this side so this side is synopsis of the law of, of the maintenance logs uh, for the engines not the fuselage so I'm not sure where they split But I mean, you, it's, and then it's, you're working with the Beechcraft Society or American Bonanza Society. You work in Beach Talk. You get in there where these guys, you know, um, threads or like blogs and threads. You can find some good information on the internet where to, where to cross, cross reference. So you could take this part number. So I take take this one part number here and I can't find it but there's take that number and I can go in here to the computer to continental web page and pull up the lot pull up there pull this parts manual up in the continental web page and they're different different a lot of them are different part numbers so I can go it's the same picture so to speak so I know what gasket is the same. So I can then I, I've got the old part number, which nothing comes up. And then I I pull in from off the screen. I pull in the new part number, and I can pull it up. And it's dollar fifty for a gasket or something like that. But on the old part number, I was nothing unavailable. So that's what I'm getting at. And then. <laughs> It's a dollar twenty for a gasket, four cents for a washer or something, and then it'll be seventy-five dollars for a washer because it's a special washer. Or you know, I mean, it's insane. So if you don't pay attention to detail and ev I mean, down to the washers, because sometimes you'll 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 need a couple washers, special washers in the system because of the vibration, just because of the way it's designed, and you need to follow follow the rules so to speak um you order one uh, there's washers i've seen in here over 17 dollars just for the washer that's not a box of 100 so you see one for 17 dollars and you think it's 100 you order you think you're, you order 100 of those you're ordering 100 at 17 dollars each and the next washer over is four cents and you can only you only can get them by the hundred and it costs you know, four bucks very dangerous financially you can easily get your head cut off if you don't pay attention to the old because you still need the old part numbers I mean a uh, uh, guy from Gibi the, the guy that had those blue the, the blue gaskets and the blue seals he's got an original 1960s early 60s parts manual for the Baron he said he'll send it to me and let me take it to Kinko's or what have you and copy it and he says it breaks way more down than the new the new manuals because they show less and less they want less and less responsibility so to speak the old stuff really should broke it down so you find you, you know what you need from the old numbers and how do you cross reference over into the new numbers oh yeah and if you don't 
I'm finding the new numbers are somewhat cheaper than the old numbers. Uh, it's crazy. And then the other way around, and some stuff, one company, so on my parts list, well, I'm not sure exactly why I said it. This is my main, my main working list that I've put together of both the Baron and both the engine, the engines, and the fuselage. There's 300 line items on an Excel spreadsheet that I made. And the red, so each column I've got, so this is like a good filled out one here. So, let's say this part number, a bushing, no, let's try it again. Here. Let's go this one here. So that's standard, standard part number, washer, special, general. Yeah, look, $14, $11, $11 for the cheap, that's a washer. And I need 11 or 10, of, I need 10 of these washers at $11 each. And then, let's see. This is all the generators. That's why this is weird, because this this is all the generator mounting brackets and everything. <clears throat> Crazy little brackets and stuff. Seven hundred dollars for a bracket. Was it eight hundred, nine hundred dollars for a bracket? We're talking a little bracket that fits in my hand. Palm of my hand, made out of fairly thin eighth inch steel. It's hot, it was heated and pressed stamped and you can form it out in in the forge forge and fire and you can bust it out and make a whole new one in a couple hours it went nine hundred dollars for it. it looks like it holds a toilet roll i call it the toilet roll dispenser but that's cheap that's the this is the no that's the pulley bracket 703 that is that is really cheap because i pulled that part number up on textron to beechcraft Cessna factory and it came back for $8,500 for this little bracket that holds toilet paper $8,500 bucks that's what I'm saying you can't just take the mechanic you can't pull your airplane in you can't pull your airplane into the shop and then just toss in the keys and the, and the logs and say tell me when to you know call me when you're done you'll, you'll leave out of there with with a $25,000 repair bill and not have much to show for it. A couple new items. You haven't even done avionics. You haven't touched new radios or transponders or lights and new interior or comfort. No, none of that. This is replacing some shaft or some cable that looked like it was due to repair or the factory or someone suggested that needs to be replaced well you give the mechanic car blanc to fix anything that needs to be fixed and he'll fix it or she'll fix it now they don't have they love it they pull parts all day long they don't cross-reference parts they don't look for cheaper parts they don't call around for parts they just go where their main source is and this is what i need if they don't have to go to the next one they don't care what the price is and they add 30 percent on top of it so don't take shit from your mechanic you are the one hiring the mechanic to do the job and that's it if they can't do the job fire them but you think you work for them right I bought to no they work for you as the owner you're the one paying the bill you're the one who calls the shots and if the owner gets all into it and blah 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 well then just terminate the inspection right there and call it done Pay for services rendered and move out. Take it down, park it outside, park it on the ramp. Do with whatever you got to do, but get it out of the shop. Don't let them make it hostage. Try to, uh, what I'm learning is not to give the guy the log books. They, make, they, they, they can put everything on a little sticky, write it all up and sign it and everything, give it to the aircraft owner, and the aircraft owner can stick it in the log book. No rules. No laws, nowhere say that you have to give the mechanic the logbooks. The only thing the mechanic has to know is be able to prove 
what maintenance has been done in ADs, make sure the ADs have been done, the uh, certain other things have been finished, but that's only to verify. And if not, then the mechanic says he, the ADs weren't in compliance because he doesn't have the, the logs to do it. But you, there's ways around it. You can photocopy them, photocopy the sections that you need, because FAA says you only need to keep maintenance records back for the previous year. And you've, I got a 1964 airplane, and I got records all the way back from it came out of the factory. And that's where all the airplanes are. The more records you have on your aircraft, the longer it goes back, uh, kind of the more story picture, or the more, the more value that's in it. If you, you can buy an airplane with no logs. Happens all the time. Repos, um, uh, death in the family, or fire and burn the house down, burn the log books down, you know, in the fire. You can, re you can regenerate log books, especially working with an IA, AMPIA, and uh, just set up, this is your best belief, this is what you think, this is where the engines are, blah, 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 and you make your, your best estimate, and you fill that out, and you just start new logs from that point forward. That's you, not the mechanic. It's not the mechanic's job. It's the owner's job. The owner has to fill all that out and sign and attest for it. Not the mechanic. Mechanic can't say oh, those mags got 600 hours. Can't, who gives a shit what the mechanic thinks? The mechanic is hired to do a job and do the job. If you can't do the job, then get the fuck out. I'll put someone in there that can. And if there's problems, we're going to deal with those problems. You're not going to hold me hostage. Keep my log books. I'm not playing that game. So anyway... Because it, it's attention to detail. And you got somebody all of a sudden that has no authority, jumps in your shit, call the FAA, call FISDO, tell them I'm missing a right wing. I don't, I don't care. Plane belongs to me. Actually, plane belongs to the company, and I work for the company. But I have my own airplane. I have a, I have a Bonanza in West Virginia. Tim Moles owns his own airplane. Not the Baron. The Baron belongs to the company. And I'm working my ass off for this company, trying to keep it from not getting financially in ruin. And produce a fine quality product that will last for years to come. So, anyway, I hope that wasn't a ramble or a rant. Just I mean, you don't just let other people spend your money because they have no pro they don't know when to shut it off they don't care and and there's guys out there with money that don't care because they, they're sitting on it right they've done whatever but a disabled veteran on disabled veteran pay you <laughs> have to watch every nickel make this work and I enjoy it it's a great thing for me to do and so I'm going to keep chugging on and turn this into a fine operation and hopefully make a little money at the end of this it's an investment I took my money invested it into this airplane and I'm not here to make a shiny turd I'm here to clean the turds out of it and make a good, good vehicle. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching again. And um, keep flying Microsoft Flight Sim. <laughs> it's all calculated where it's all flat. Love you guys. Bye.